Hello, everyone, every listener. Welcome back to the Crucible that is the Chaos Ball Podcaster in the off season. It's actually quite the opposite of a Crucible right now, I feel like. Um, or at least a Crucible with no hot molten metal inside of it melting. Uh, it's a cold Crucible. Nothing has happened, really. Uh, the off season still, it's still just kicking off. I mean, they're just finishing up awards, which... I'll talk a little bit more about why they still they don't. MLB just has not gotten awards correct uh, ever. I feel like not the voting, like the outcome, just like the timing of it just makes uh, little to no sense to me. Um, but welcome back. Thanks for tuning in. Before half of you jump off after the one minute mark, uh, off the cuff, this, this episode, I'm talking about Blake Snell later in the episode, though, if you want to stick around or try to skip to that. I'm not putting timestamps in here. You can try to find when I start talking about Blake Snell. Uh, but he just won a Cy Young. Uh, he is from the Seattle area. If y'all didn't know, there's some chatter on the internet about Blake Snell. And I have a fun little comp to throw at you to take some people back down to earth a little bit. But that's later in the show. I will start by talking about some Twitter delusion. I have some more thoughts on their, the Mariners middle infield situation. The general vibe of free agency I'm, I'm feeling... Uh, and then the Mariners did hire someone. There's some other random stuff to talk about. Uh, could be a shorter episode. Could not be. Really, it's up to me, myself, and I to make that decision today. Uh, but I did want to chat. I did want to put out an episode today because the next couple weeks probably won't be releasing a pod. Next week uh, is Thanksgiving week, and I, unless I find time on the Sunday when I get back from going to Thanksgiving then I probably won't release a pod next week unless something happens. Unless some something happens, then I will then I maybe I'll find time to do it. Uh, and then the following week, uh I'm probably busy at work and also uh moving that weekend, so I don't think I'll really have the time to record a podcast. Again, next two weeks will probably be quiet unless something happens. Like show her tiny signs with the Rockies you know that then I'll record a podcast but uh just wanted to get one out today for that reason and let's start off let's talk about Twitter I have been trying I've been trying I'm not calling it X for anyone who hasn't listened to me talk about Twitter uh I've I'm not calling it X it's a stupid name uh Twitter terrible for the off season. terrible in general I mean I love it I'm a sicko but I've been trying to stay off of Mariners Twitter because I'm on it so much during the season that I, I, and I'm on it so much outside of my podcast account on my personal account a lot. Anyway, I've been trying to stay off of Mariners off season Twitter because off season Twitter for every team, for any sport is pretty terrible. Uh, but particularly if, if you had such a season and as the Mariners season just did, and the, we just saw the playoffs unfold and a rival, uh, win the World Series in a way that no, I'm not even gonna get into it. I talked about the Rangers already, but it, it's it's made it that much worse. There's a lot of pressure on the team to do things, and the fans are obviously voicing that on the internet. And the discourse has already been terrible. It was like Thursday. No, it was Friday. It was a Friday morning, and I and I why did I get on Twitter? I don't know. I think I must have gotten a pass in notification. And I was on my my Twitter account for the podcast at Chaos Ball nineteen seventy seven. If you don't follow me, do so. And as one does in free agency in the off season Twitter, there's lots of polls going around by Mariners accounts. I don't really do polls. I I mean it'd be I could do polls. I, it would be interesting. I don't do them. I feel like I've done like one ever. I just I feel like it's just kind of engagement farming, even though I do think it's fun to see what people pull. I've got nothing against engagement farming on Twitter. I just don't really do that. Uh, but there's a lot of polls. There's some accounts that just do polls all the time during the off season, and I'll let them do that. There was a poll. There was a poll that had the hypothetical trade, and this is a very common poll topic during the off season, especially with a team that trades as heavily as the Seattle Mariners do. It was a Soto-involved deal with Jared Kelnick. Uh, there's been a lot of Soto chat, too, since he seems to be on the trade block, and he would kind of fit the Mariners' 
what the Mariners need. He'd fit on any team, but especially the Mariners. It was Kelnick for Soto straight swap. That was the pull. It was like just te- it was I th- I think the I'm not remembering the Twitter account. I can see it in my head, but I don't remember the name. But it was just would you do that, Kelnick for Soto? If the Padres, if I was the Mariners and the Padres offered me that, I would I'd think I was being punked. I couldn't do that deal quick enough. I I really couldn't. Like that is the holy grail of hypothetical deals. It will never happen. There's simply no way the Padres would do that. I think I think the Mariners wouldn't even do it. They'd be like, "No, something's wrong with them. Something's wrong with Soto. Why would they do that?" And I voted no, and then I tweeted about this because I was like, because some people voted yes, or some people, or I mean, I voted yes, I would do the deal, and there was like 20% of people, maybe even more, who voted no, and I get in the mentions of this tweet, and I see people trying to rationalize it, and then so I send out a tweet of my own, and it's that gif of the Simpsons grandpa walking into the bar, taking his hat off, walking straight back out with his hat. And I was like, I just got on Manor's Twitter and saw people trying to rationalize not trading Jared Kelnick straight up for Juan Soto. And some of these people got in my mentions, and there was no ill will. I have pretty, I have pretty rational discussions with people on that website because uh, I think people are entitled to their opinions, especially in a matter as trivial as sports. I don't think it's life or death. But these people were in my mentions because I was like, in what world? Would you decline that trade? Like, you're delusional. You were actually delusional if you wouldn't accept that trade. People were in my mentions saying I would not trade Jared Kelnick for Juan Soto. Juan Soto's a rental. He's a free agent after next season. Kelnick has four more years of control, and he's only getting better. Brother, what are we doing? What What are we doing? How... I understand that people on the internet don't have as good of a grasp on how players are, how good players are, especially if you were kind of just, if you're mainly focused on Mariners, I can see the world where you're like, this guy Kelnick, he's so young, he's got so much control, he got better this year, I mean, you can project if you think he's going to get better year after year, you can just say, yeah, was, you know, he's just going to keep getting better. I don't hate that, but I don't think Jared Kelnick is ever going to sniff the level of player Juan Soto is. It's killing me that people would hang on to him, and I think it's literally because like emotional attachment to a guy who we got in a trade who was one of the top prospects, if not he was the top prospect in that trade. I think it's just emotions of like, I don't want to get rid of him. I want to see him be good here because there's no other reason objectively you'd think that's a good trade. I'm navigating to my tweet now because um, most people agreed with me. I mean, most people were like, no, I would do that in a heartbeat and it's never going to happen. I was like, yeah, I agree. I agree with that. It's never going to happen. But if it did happen, the Mariners would be actually insane to deny that. Uh <laughs> This one person in my mentions is like, I think it most comes from three perceived truths. Firstly, believe him to be a young man with character, desire, discipline, and resilience. Sure. He's a baseball robot. He's going to do whatever he can to be better at baseball. That's We know that. Second, he has improved each season. I mean, Sure. I'll give you that. Third, he had stretches of excellent play. Typically, young players rise to their ceilings. That, I said, was straight up false, because it is. This person replied and was like, we'll see the 169 WRC plus of April. It's not out of the question to see that. Obviously, we saw it once. We can expect to see it again. We should also see the low 71 WRC plus in June less often. How do you know that? What, what, are, you, what are you saying? And... Then I was like, do you like, I asked, I was like, do you have anything to back up why you think Kelnick will skew closer to the April production going forward? I just think it's wishful thinking unless you can actually back it up because there's just a much larger sample of him being a bad baseball player than him being a good baseball player. 
And then this 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 woman was like, "No, you're right. He sucks. He always will. We should just get rid of him, DFA him." And I'm, you won me over. I'm like, okay. I guess I guess end of argument. You have no nothing to back this up. Like if you if you're in my mentions, uh, you have to be able to back up your baseball thoughts. And if you just say, "Oh, I just want him to be good, and I want to hold on to him, and I think he's going to be good. I've got nothing to back it up." That's fine. I don't care. You can think any player is going to be good. That's fine if you think that. It's just craziness. People and other people, not in my mentions, were trying to rationalize this trade. I don't understand it. I just don't get it. One guy was like, if Soto would be for multiple years, then yeah, that's ridiculous. But he'd only be here for one year. One year of Juan Soto, I would take over the next four of Jared Kelnick. In a heartbeat. It's not even... It's not even fair. And then this one, I'm, I'm going to be done talking about this interaction after. There's one particular account that really, I think, is trolling. Kellnick has team control. Soto does not. What's the issue? And then I said, would much rather have Soto for one year than JK for the next four. And then he said, well, I can't have a reasonable discussion about it then because that is just kind of stupid. And then it kind of went on and I was like, I don't know, pretty sure, uh, pretty sure this guy's a troll. This makes zero sense. Um, no, listen, I want to go on record. If Jared Kelnick was offered for Juan Soto straight up, I would do it. I would do it as quick as I possibly could. Uh, and then there was one other Twitter interaction I wanted to talk about. To, to just to get this off my chest. It was so funny. So the day, um, I don't remember what day it was, but I, I tweeted something about Eugenio and the Blue Jays because there was a report that was like the Blue Jays are looking to trade for a third baseman. Um, Eugenio Suarez is like on their list. He's like a target. And I saw that and was like, well, that, I mean, that doesn't really make sense. Why would they want to trade for Eugenio Suarez? They want to trade for a guy who just had a really good defensive season and a pretty lackluster one at the plate. I mean, just re-sign Matt Chapman at that point or get a cheaper option that's younger that at least, like, I don't know, I think Eugenio is older and on the downswing right now offensively. It just didn't make sense to me why they would want to trade for him for numerous baseball reasons. And I tweeted something along those lines. I was basically just like, why would a Eugenio even be a trade candidate for them? Like, it just really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. It just feels like it would be just a meh move for a team that's in limbo right now as the Blue Jays are. And all like almost all of the replies to this tweet were like, it's because Chapman is a free agent and the Blue Jays need a third baseman. Like, y'all, I am aware. I am fully aware that Matt Chapman is a free agent. That is not what I'm questioning here. I just didn't reply because I was like, I I don't have the energy for this. That is not the reason to just go out and trade for like a 32 year old uh, third baseman who just had the worst offensive season he's had in five years. That it just killed me that people were like, well, obviously they trade for him because Chapman's a free agent. They don't have a third baseman. It's like, of course, of co- okay, sure, all right. <laughs> just so funny this is why i've been trying to spend less time on twitter because it's it sucks me in it sucks me in and then i i delude myself but that was it those are my twitter interactions the Kelnick one really sent me over the edge i was reeling it was a friday morning i didn't have much work to do so i was just sitting on twitter for like half an hour arguing with these people and i really i i just can't i think it's just blind hope that Kelnick is going to be a really good player I still don't see it. I've been very vocal about that. Nothing against him. And if if they go into the year with him as the fourth outfielder, I am all for that. I am absolutely all for that. Realistically, I feel like he's more of a add on to a trade rather than the headliner. Like if there's a Soto trade, I don't think it'd be like Jared Kelnick and company heads to San Diego for Juan Soto. I think it would be Logan Gilbert heads to San Diego with with Jared Kelnick for Juan Soto. Or Harry, Harry Ford or Cole Young heads to heads to San Diego with Juan Soto and Jared Kelnick and another prospect's in the deal. Like I don't 
don't think Kelnick's really a headliner of a trade at this point. Uh, but that's all. That's all for my little Twitter rant. But um, I've been thinking. I've been thinking a little bit. Pivot. I've been thinking about the Mariners' middle infield situation. J.P. Crawford, also MVP vote getter, one ninth place and three tenth place votes. J.P. Crawford. I want to make that distinction here. Uh, we're good with him. I mean, he's the he's the shortstop. He's not the middle infield position that I want to talk about. It's second base. Second base is the question. It's been the question since Cano left. It's hasn't been answered since Cano left. It's it's been patchwork. It's been eh. It's been blech. It's been nothing. It's been a black hole. I I I think we're gonna find out what Ryan Bliss is. Next year, I feel like the Mariners aren't going to sign a second baseman. Uh, I feel like we're going to find out what Ryan Bliss is. Get a healthy dose of Josh Rojas and probably some Dylan Moore there. I, I, And I don't necessarily think that's the wrong move either if they end up doing that. Unless... Like, unless they get a second baseman from a trade, like, unless the Cardinals want to give you, like, Brendan Donovan for a pitcher or something wacky like that, uh, the free agent market for that position is just so meh. Like, I, I talked about the guys available last week. It's just a, it's a take a flyer type of position. Like, Whit Merrifield's probably the safest bet at second base, but he's aging, and I don't think that'd even be that worthwhile of a signing. I'd take it. I just, I feel like their money, especially if they're on a budget, I think their money is better spent elsewhere than on a second baseman. I think DH and outfield is what should be the priority. Uh, maybe they do trade for a second baseman. I'm just, I feel like I'm, I'm okay with being in the camp of not doing much for that position. Even though Bliss, like he had a good end of the year, he had some highlights in fall league, but he could be a quad A guy. I I think I need people to start learning from their past mistakes of, of thinking where a lot of people thought Taylor Trammell was going to be awesome because he produced in triple A. A lot of guys of a lot of people constantly are like, look at what this guy's doing. Like he look at what he's look at how he's hitting. Look at his highlights, look at his numbers in triple A or even the fall league, and it's like I you can't. You just can't do that to yourself again. How many times do we have we seen Taylor Trammell rake in AAA and then not do shit at the major league level? There's a reason there's quad A. There's a reason there's that term. The jump to AAA to the majors is the hardest jump to make, and it's increasingly getting harder. Guys have talked about that for ages now. So I skew more the scouts, and the scouts say... He's probably max 45 future value prospect. Right now, he could totally make, like, guys blow that stuff out of the water all the time just by making improvements um, that scouts don't see, and then they come out and have a great season. But, like, 45 future value at a max ceiling prospect-wise for him right now is, like, you know, kind of everyday player. Like, not an all-star, like, maybe league average, a little bit better than league average. It's not, like, an amazing player. So I don't know. I don't know. I just don't, I don't want, like a lot of people are like Ryan Bliss, every second baseman. I just don't, I don't want to get my hopes up for that. And I don't think really that's even going to happen, to be honest with you. Um, I don't know exactly what to make of Josh Rojas, but he had a way better time of it with the Mariners after he got traded than he did last year with the D-backs. And the market, again, it's just not really there, out there. And I think the money can be better spent elsewhere. Uh, getting a second baseman through a trade uh, shouldn't be ruled out of the question, but like speculating on trades is fun, but I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. It's very hard to predict, but it's, it's more hopeful thinking when you think of trades. Uh, so that's my position on second base. Wouldn't be super upset if they didn't do much. Uh, as long as they actually meaningfully spend on other parts of the team, I don't think second base should be like the massive priority here. I think you have enough guys who can play it. And I'm willing to just kind of take a, not take a flyer on Ryan Bliss, but try him out at least, see what you got for him. I mean, you traded, you got him in a trade for Paul Sewell at the deadline, like you might as well try to play him, right? And I think they will. I, I think he'll probably, worst case, play second base, back up third, back up second, what run, you know, pinch run, whatever. Uh, I just, I, I want, if you're listening to this and you are on the Ryan Bliss hype train, more power to you. I just don't. 
We've seen this before. I, I just quad A. Think of quad A. I just I want to see what he can do in the majors before making any um, any claims about his skill set, especially considering where the Tacoma Rainiers play and what division they are in. I'll talk about that too. Don't need to talk about that more. Otani. Shohei Otani. Pivoting to another topic. Otani, uh, he just won the MVP. Not surprising. I f- I'm thinking like, I'm thinking he might hold up a lot of free agent signings. Like maybe not on the pitching side. Um, Maybe not on the pitching side. And, oh. I just got a Twitter notification from John Morosi that the Reds are discussing Jonathan India trade possibilities with three or four teams. I see a lot of negativity with uh, Jonathan India just because people look at his numbers and it's it's somewhat underwhelming. But I don't think it really take much to get him considering the Reds are looking to move him and they are a little crowded at the infield prospect department. I am willing to believe a guy like Jonathan India who we've seen hit well at the major league level can find that again rather than bet on um, like if you wanted to go sign Whit Merrifield or one of the other ones available, I'd rather trade for Jonathan India. Um, and if it's not going to take much, then sure, trade for him. Like you, I get you. Yeah, like I, we just we just talked about this, Ryan Bliss, Josh Rojas, whatever. If it's not going to take a whole lot, like if you just straight up Bryce Miller for Jonathan India, I think I do that trade because I'm willing to bet on India making improvements. Uh, And I could be very wrong. But again, I'd rather bet on India than like Ryan Bliss or any of the free agents, to be quite honest. I like I'm willing to believe uh, India could become a better everyday player. And he's already fine. Um, It comes down to the cost, I guess, of the trade. But when like he was up for when this news like broke a couple weeks ago that they might trade him this off season, everyone on Mariners Twitter obviously oh second base okay, let's trade for Jonathan India and then people people looked at his numbers and were like okay no let's not give up anything for this guy he stinks I I'm I'm willing to trade for a guy like that because maybe he just needs a little change of scenery huh how about that No, the Mariners will trade for him and he'll become the worst player ever. Um, That's just what's going to happen. But back to talking about Shohei Otani and free agency. That derailed me a little bit. I thought Jonathan had gotten traded, but no. Uh, So to Otani, I I feel like he's going to hold up some free agent signings. And like I said, maybe not as as much on the pitching side. Uh, Depends on the team. Because he's not going to be pitching, obviously. Uh, Depends on the team, for sure. Uh, Because some teams... They're not gonna like they they probably want to sign some position players, but they need pitching a lot. Like like the Cardinals, I don't, I don't think Otani's gonna hold up them trying to sign best pitchers right now. Let me sit my tea. Uh, but team for teams like the Mariners and others who are looking for a position player or even a DH type, I think Otani might just limit exactly what they want to do right now. Like the Mariners signing Jorge Soler or to Oscar Hernandez, like two guys who can play the field a little bit and fit that DH role. Like, I don't think the M's would want to sign them before absolutely knowing about Otani and like what he's doing, what the vibes are. Cause I don't think they'd ever sign Soler or to Oscar and then Otani or vice versa. I don't think they're spending that kind of dough. I don't think they're signing Otani at all, but this is a hypothetical for other teams. Like, I feel like he might be a domino that falls and triggers the the run on the la- on like the limited position players available your your Bellingers your Teoscars your Solaires of guys of that type uh I feel like Otani might just delay that cuz again if teams think they have a chance with Otani they're not going to go out and sign a DH right now unless of course they're like me 
and are built different and would just sign Otani and all of the other good players because if I was a billionaire owner, that's what I would do. But uh, that is not a reality. Uh, that is my thoughts on Otani. I was just thinking about that. The Mariners. There was some news with the Mariners going all over the place in this episode, but they did hire a coach. They hired Brant Brown. This is pretty relevant. From the Marlins. Initially, it was like, okay, they're hiring another hitting coach. So they have two hitting coaches. One of them, I believe it's... Um, I actually, actually don't know. I think it's the one that I met in San Diego last year. Or this year. Uh, he's moving to the bullpen coach role to fill the Stephen Vogt bo- void. Because uh, he got hired by the Guardians for manager. So they're looking for a hitting coach. And they hired Brent Brown. Or they're hiring him from the Marlins. Apparently not to be that hitting coach role, but to be like a hitting coordinator, strategist. I saw the term offensive coordinator thrown around, which is pretty funny. Uh, he, which I, so I guess he's not going to be technically the other hitting coach, but he's going to be involved in the offensive side of coaching in some capacity, which is interesting. So they're still looking for another hitting coach, but uh, this guy, he coached with the Dodgers, um, and he was in the manager system a long time ago, but hitting coach with the Dodgers, I think like 2017 to 2022. Then just last season with the Marlins, uh, had a pretty successful year. I feel like he was proven to be a good hitting coach. Did he help Soler have a bounce back season last year or this year? Hard to say. Maybe he did. Or, or did Soler just hear me say that I'm expecting a bounce back season from him? in my uh, preseason podcast when I previewed the Marlins. Also hard to say, you know, who's to say who actually made a bigger impact there. It's literally impossible to say. You don't know. Uh, But he's not going to be a hitting coach for the team, like I said, Uh, but they hired him, so he's going to be involved in some capacity. Does that hint that they're going to sign Jorge Soler? I don't know. I think it'd be a good signing. I think that definitely fits what they need at the moment. Uh, Like... I'm thinking of that position, like Justin Turner you could throw in there as well because he was on the Dodgers when Brown was there coaching. Both those guys would fill the role. Like Turner's probably pretty DH only at this point in his career. You could probably still get some, maybe get some third base, first base out of him at this point. Uh, Solaire, I think, could still play the field a little bit outfield, but he's trending in the direction of DH only. So both those guys would quite honestly make sense. And honestly, signing both of them wouldn't be a bad strategy here. Just signing proven hitters is fine. Uh, Solaire would definitely fit in uh, T-Mobile. He is a right-handed home run hitter that plays quite well at T-Mobile Park, like I've talked about. He would just be a slugger. He, I mean, he had a really good year last year. I think he's, I think he's just a guy who can hit home runs a lot. And doesn't exactly like f- address the needs of the the team needing to strike out less. But again, I still think you need guys who can hit home runs, so that helps. Um, but that was interesting. That's like I don't, if he if Brent Brown's like a really good friend with Jorge Soler after this last season with the Marlins, then that probably gives the Mariners a leg up in signing him, and uh, you can reasonably be project Solaire to sign with the Mariners. But I guess you can't reasonably project anyone to sign with the Mariners because you don't know what they're going to do. They could go to the winter meetings and boast that they didn't even try to sign anyone there like they did last year because they're just built different. You know, they're just like, no, we're going to go to the winter meetings, but we're not going to talk to anyone. No free agents. We're not interested. Uh, Yeah. All right. To my random thoughts. And then we speak about Blake Snell. The A's move to Vegas is clearly very well thought out and planned, and nothing will go wrong, I'm sure. Just announced today, as I'm recording, uh, officially unanimous vote from the owners to move, and then that followed with corresponding tweets of from 2025 to 2027. They don't have a home currently. They'll have to figure out where to play. There was talk of uh, Sacramento at the minor league stadium. I believe it's the River Cats up there. Uh, UNLV, their baseball stadium. It just is clear that they tried to rush this as quick as possible to give as little, like to just get it officially done so then they can get all their ducks in a row for the move. 
which seems like the usually leagues kind of want you to have your ducks in a row a little bit more before doing this, but this seems like a very unique case. Really sucks for the people of Oakland to see it happen this way. Uh, and it's just surprising it's this team moving. I mean, this team has a storied history, not only as one of the first baseball teams in general, and a Philadelphia Athletics history that has a lot of lore to it, but also just in Oakland. They have won in Oakland. They've been there since the 60s. That's a very long time. That's longer than the Mariners. That's, they existed. That's longer than a lot of teams have existed. That's longer than a lot of teams have been in their current cities. It's And it's crazy that they've won there before, and then it's getting moved because the owner is a little bitch and wants to have other people pay to build the stadium for him so he can continue to make passive money on this team that he owns and not give a shit about it. That is my thoughts on the matter. It just sucks. Next random thought. MLB doesn't do, they just don't do awards correctly. Why do they wait until the World Series is over and no one thinks about baseball? Once the World Series ends, it's off season that I care about, but most people, it's like, no, it's basketball season. It's already been football season. And like you have college basketball starting, you have NBA starting, you have football already going on. And then you slap these awards and then you don't even do like an award show. You have each award every day and it's all virtual. If you're going to have the awards come after the World Series and all that, at least do an award show. Like I think at least do all the awards on one night in one big venue, have all the stars there. I don't know why they don't do that. Is it because they're lazy? Like they don't want to? That would be way more fun than what they currently do. Either that, or do the awards right when the season's over. I mean, I get the playoffs happen, but it still just makes no sense. It feels like literally no one gives a shit about the awards at all. And they don't, really. (laughs) They don't, for that reason. Because then also, there's a lot of people who are like, oh my god. Like, it's happened in the past. It's like, oh, MVP's got to even play in the playoffs. Or, oh, coach of the year, he lost in the first round of the playoffs. Like, Bruce Bochy, he didn't win coach of the year. Brandon Hyde did of the Baltimore Orioles because it's a regular season award. But the last thing they remember of Brandon Hyde is losing. They don't remember him. The last thing they remember of not coach of the year Bruce Bochy or manager of the year Bruce Bochy is winning the World Series and not winning manager of the year. Which, again, again by the rules, that makes sense. But <laughs> it's MLB awards. They MLB just doesn't... I just feel like they don't use their brains when they think of things. Because... How fun would an award show be? Like in a huge venue, like you have all the all the people there. You can have some some people speak. I don't know. You can have a, like what they do at the Grammys and stuff. You can have like a memorial of all the baseball people that died that year, so we can all remember them in a really good light. Like you get the awards to everyone in person. It's the way they do it now. It's it's just lackluster and and dumb. Uh, then also I want to talk about the MVP voting. Cal Raleigh got a 10th place vote. He's a MVP vote getter. J.P. Crawford, I mentioned, got three 10th place and one 9th place vote. And Julio Rodriguez came in fourth in MVP voting. Top five. That is our man. Julio Rodriguez. First guy to do that in a marriage uniform since Cano in 2014. Thank you, Alex Meyer. And that is pretty awesome. That was pretty great. So congrats to Julio, especially insane considering the lackluster three months that he had, uh, that he ends up finishing the season with good enough counting stats and aura that he finishes fourth in MVP voting. Like That's a testament to how special this dude is, and we will not be taking him for granted at all. The last thought before I talk about Blake Snell is the Mariners should sign Jung Ho Lee. Jung Ho Lee is a Korean outfielder who will be posted, I believe, I'm all aboard the Jung Ho Lee train, and I will now be upset officially if the Mariners don't sign him. I am Team Jung Ho Lee. He looks like an absolutely complete hitter. Uh, the power is not super there, but they don't really, like, I talked about how they still need home run guys. They also just need guys who are good at hitting, who can play in the outfield. Dink, dink, check off those two marks. Jung Ho Lee can do both of those things. Uh, just 
looks like a really well-rounded hitter. Like some power, but really good bat-to-ball skills, uh, just good contact ability, and also very good eye. He's consistently walked more than he struck out in the Korean uh, Baseball League, uh, the KBO, and I think the Mariners should sign him. It would make sense. I don't think he'd even be that expensive. I feel like not many people are really talking about him in the mainstream as one of the top free agents, but I think he should be. I think he deserves to be in that category especially considering the lackluster names in the position players. It's very short. And I think the manager should sign Jung Ho Lee. That is my stance. Please, please, Jerry, sign him, sign him. Now, let's talk about Blake Snell, shall we? Blake Snell just won the NL Cy Young. There's been a lot of chatter recently. Uh, Boob Nightingale on Twitter said that he wants to go to Seattle. He's interested because it's his hometown and all of that. Should they sign Blake Snow? Uh, and it's funny, this came up. I had this random thought written down in my notes app uh, from a couple weeks ago, and I was meaning to talk about it. This is a perfect time to talk about it. Um, the Blake Snow Cy Young this year, and I knew he was going to win the Cy Young. Everyone did. Gives me like insane Robbie Ray 2021 Cy Young vibes, like to a T. And so... I had that thought, and I was like, hmm, I wonder if the stats back it up, because I wasn't even really going on stats, although stats are always in my mind. I was more thinking the vibes. And then I looked at the stats, and it is astoundingly similar, the years that they had. And I'll tell you why... No, no. I'm going to read you the stats first, and then regale you with my thoughts on him signing with the Mariners potentially. So Blake Snell in 2023 versus Robbie Ray 2021. Cy Young seasons from two southpaws, both heading into free agency. That's two similarities already right there. Innings pitched. Blake Snell pitched 180. Robbie Ray pitched 193 and a third. ERA. Blake Snell 2.25 to Robbie Ray's 2.84. K's. Blake Snell, 234 to Robbie Ray's 248. K per nine. Blake Snell, 11.7 K per nine. Robbie Ray, 11.54. So after four stats I've thrown at you, pretty similar. Doesn't it sound pretty similar? This next stat is the basically the only outlier in here. It's walks per nine. Blake Snell led the league in walks this year. Uh, 4.95 for him per nine. Robbie Ray in 2021, 2.42. So that's really the only outlier here. That is that is the big difference. Otherwise, all of these stats, pretty similar. F war, fan graph war. Blake Snell, 4.1. Robbie Ray in 2021, 3.9. Baseball reference war. Blake Snell, 6 on the dot. Robbie Ray, 6.9. That one is a little bit more disparaging as well. That's probably the second biggest gap. FIP, again, fielding independent pitching. We've talked about it. Three true outcome essentially uh, weighted the same as ERA. 3.44 for Blake Smell, Smell, Blake Snell to 3.69 for Robbie Ray. I have five more stats to throw at you, but after that, just sit with those. Strikingly similar. Uh, and you can see why, like, F War versus Baseball Reference War. Uh, Fangraphs uses FIP to calculate this, and Baseball Reference uses runs allowed uh, per nine, which is why both of their wars are so much higher in Baseball Reference, because both of them had really low ERAs and higher FIPs than their ERA by like one, one whole point almost for both of them. So very similar. I was pretty surprised at those numbers, and those are pretty basic numbers that I look at about how similar the years were. I mean... I was going off like they're both they both kind of throw junk pitches or strikeout pitchers and I thought that the years would be really hard to replicate statistically just because of the variance of their peripheral numbers versus their raw numbers like their ER like I don't think that should be used to determine Cy Young like I think these are both very deserving Cy Youngs these are both really good pitching years just when you have such a disparity between like your FIP and your other expected numbers to your ERA. That's not exactly sustainable, uh, but that's just how the cookie crumbled for them those years. And uh, I, I, I wouldn't really use like FIP in a, in a Cy Young 
uh, if I was voting for Cy Young. I would I would use Fangraph's War as part of it, which includes FIP, but I wouldn't really weight FIP as, whole, as whole, a whole lot. I'm fine with using ERA to vote. Now, I have five more stats for you, and these are these are a doozy if you aren't super into baseball stats. I'm going to start with expected ERA. Now, this one's easy. It's I'm not going to tell you how it's calculated, but... It's it's what it sounds like. It's ERA that they're expected to have based on every possible whatever this season that went into the stat. Blake Snell, 3.77 expected ERA compared to his 2.25 ERA. Robbie Ray in 2021, 3.6 expected ERA to his 2.84 ERA in 2021. So both, again, ERAs were much lower than than maybe they should have been. And then you get into stats, and I'm going to talk about minus stats. You've heard of OPS Plus. You've heard of WRC Plus. This is Fangraph's version of these, but for pitchers. So 100 would be league average, and anything under that is above league average. ERA minus for Blake Snell this year, 54. So that would be 46% better than league average ERA, which is phenomenal. That's like about as good as you can do. Robbie Ray in 2021, 63. Close yet again. Now FIP minus, same thing. Same weight, just using FIP. Blake Snell, this year, 80. Robbie Ray in 2021, 87. Blake Snell's ex-FIP, which is expected FIP minus. Expected FIP minus for Blake Snell this year, 83. Expected FIP minus for Robbie Ray in 2021, 79. And then my wonderful stat that I love to use, Sierra. Skill Interactive ERA. I like this more than FIP. If anything, if any peripheral I'd use to determine award voting, it would be this one. Blake Snell in 2023, 4.06 Sierra. Robbie Ray in 2021, 3.21. In summation, these years are eerily similar, and the circumstances that they're entering free agency are very similar. And the reason I'm bringing this up is, as I said, there's links to Seattle for Blake Snell. And... I've come to the determination that while I don't really think the Mariners should go after pitching if they have very limited money to spend because they don't need it, if Blake Snow wants to pitch in Seattle, they should sign him. Because there's not... Pitchers are different than hitters in terms of wanting to go somewhere. Like Pitchers are probably a little bit more okay going to Seattle because it's a pitcher's park than hitters. But not that many free agents like want to come play for the Seattle Mariners. So I think if any free agents do want that, for whatever reason, in this case he's from here, you should go after them. Because I don't think they'd have to offer more money than everyone else. If Blake Snell truly wants to pitch for the Mariners, and they offer him essentially market value, while it it might be lower than what other teams are offering, there's a good chance Blake Snell is like, no, I want to pitch there, and they're giving me fair money. I will pitch there. So I think they should sign him. And with that signing, I think they'll, like if they did sign him, and I still think they should trade pitching regardless, they'd have to trade pitching if they signed him. It would be untenable, the amount of pitching they'd have if they signed him and didn't trade anyone. So so I'm officially in the camp of, if Blake Snow wants to sign with the Seattle Mariners, he, they should try to sign him. Regardless of having that be their biggest strength, I just think it'd be worthwhile. And then the other thing, why did I even compare Robbie Ray and Blake Snell, besides the fact that I nailed it from a vibes and stats perspective comparing the two? It's because when the Mariners signed Robbie Ray, and the circumstances around the team were a little different then than they are now, but it was like, oh, we signed the Cy Young. And I wish I had the podcast back then. I've talked about this. There was very reasonable expectations he would not be able to repeat that year, especially looking at those stats. And then Robbie Ray goes out. And to be frank, his 2022 was closer to league average than even I expected. But I didn't expect the same year. But when you say you signed the Cy Young winner to a like five-year, what, $170 million contract or whatever it was, there's expectations immediately thrown on you to have Cy Young season after Cy Young season. And, again, there's a reasonable expectation that he wouldn't do that. And now, if the Mariners end up signing Blake Snell, I think the same thing will happen. It'll be, we just signed the Cy Young winner, and then everyone will 
will be like, oh my God, we just signed the Cy Young winner. That's awesome. And it is awesome. But then once he has a year that isn't anything like last year because of how statistics work generally and regression to the mean works and people would, and then people are upset. I just don't want that to happen again. And I can absolutely see it happening again. Now the circumstances are different when they signed Robbie Ray, they didn't have Luis Castillo. It was like signing their number one ace. And so I think there was definitely more expectation on him than there would be on Blake Snell, especially with the emergence of uh, George Kirby and Logan Gilbert, even at the, Robbie Ray signing at that point I mean we didn't know like there was you know they were highly touted prospects but we did we hadn't seen them put together amazing seasons like they both did uh this year and a little bit last year so I think the the circumstances would be different but I think it's a similar scenario where I think fans expectations would be so high and if Blake Snell comes out and has a three-point six or 3.7 era with 200 k's next year people are going to be like oh man he just wasn't as good Mariners signed a bad player like that's what happened with robbie ray so i just don't want that to happen again Uh, and i also found it super interesting how actually super similar their numbers were uh, and how much those Cy Youngs give me the same vibes. They they do to this to this day, and those numbers just confirmed it for me. So that was my Blake Snell spiel. I'm on the camp. I'm in the camp. Sign him if he wants to come to Seattle and build a insanely awesome pitching staff. Trade pitchers at the back end of the staff for hitting and bada bing bada boom. You're in a pretty good spot going into next season. But and then sign Jung Ho Lee, of course, and then bang, you're in. You're the preseason World Series favorite. Let me run the team. Uh, but that's it. That's it for this episode. My last random thought of the day is that daylight savings is dumb. It's dark at 4.30. Now, I am upset about it. Uh, please, uh, please respect me in this time of, of daylight savings. Now, daylight savings is just dumb. I just wanted to say that. It's just stupid. Uh, but anyway, that's it for this podcast. Appreciate if you're listening this far, always, uh, always will hound you to rate or review the show. If you really like it, I'm not making money on this, so that doesn't affect it that much. It's just nice. Uh, nice to see if anyone rates or reviews the show, it fills me up with joy, uh, and recommend to your friends if they're fans, And, of course, please don't get in Twitter arguments about hypothetical scenarios. Learn from my mistakes, and I will leave you with, go Mariners, go out there, and please sign Shohei Otani, Jerry.